Okay, well, thanks everybody for uh, for coming today. And as Frank had said to you, uh, we, uh, we're really excited for today's session because it builds on a whole lot of different things that we've been working on here at CSIS. Uh, and kind of makes it look like we're doing all of this on purpose, so that uh, that always helps with our image. Um, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, and our second panel today is dealing with the crude oil exports uh, portion of the discussion. I, you know, I want to just say really quickly, we're missing one of our panelists today, Kevin Book, who's an affiliate with our program and also a partner at Clearview Energy, had to go out of town last minute, so we're sorry that he can't be here, but uh, we are in really good hands with uh, Ted and Sharon, who've agreed to be part of our discussion today. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is, oh, and by the way, Lynn Westfall, you know, before, uh, before going too far, I just want to say I totally disagree with you. You are exciting when you talk about uh, Refining 101. I've seen that three times. I think it's amusing each time. I think that's the definition of exciting and interesting, so congratulations. Um, we've been working on uh, what's happening in the North American context in terms of the oil and gas uh, production surge for a lot of reasons uh, here. One is because, you know, what we do is we focus on how policy and markets and technology intersect with one another. And then, two, we try and bring together what are the strategic bearings on those conversations? How should we as people who, you know, live in the nation's capital and think about these things from a long-term uh, energy and security and strategic policy context, how should we be viewing what these, you know, uh, sometimes somewhat wonky uh, issues mean for our long-term uh, strategic foresight. And so I just wanted to hold up um, just some examples of the work that we've done. We put some, some copies out back. Um, but basically, uh, looking at, uh, coming at this from sort of two separate issues, the first is uh, a study that we did uh, two years ago now uh, that looked at the geostrategic implications of the unconventional oil and gas production surge in the United States and asked what it meant for uh, national security, for energy security and geopolitics, uh, and for sort of U.S. economic well-being. Uh, it's, it's great to see that, uh, that the messages that we had in that report about having longstanding policies that sort of signal the direction uh, of US, uh, U.S. energy policy in a foreign policy context uh, still resonate true even with all of the changes that we've seen happen geopolitically between uh, now and then. And the second study that we had just uh, released uh, earlier this year, which is really framing uh, today's event and several events that are going to come after it, are focusing on uh, what uh, Joanne uh, Shore talked a little bit about, which is um, all of the changes, and, and excuse me, Martin as well, uh, all of the changes that we've seen happen in the physical infrastructure in the market in North America. I mean, I think we spent a lot of time uh, uh, focusing on what the supply surge was, how durable it was, how long it was going to last for a good period of time, really understanding the upstream side. We've been absorbing how markets and companies uh, and, uh, and uh, state and local regulators are responding to those trends. Uh, and finally, we've sort of come to a place where we, we've got some policy issues that have to get decided on. And those policy issues, having a resolution in one direction or another, is really, really important uh, from a couple of vantage points. One, it helps the, the industry make the investments that they're trying to make on one side of the ledge or the other. Uh, and two, it sort of helps our allies, partners, and, and uh, dare I say, you know, potential adversaries around the world sort of understand how we think about energy in a foreign policy context. So we're going to be exploring all of those things uh, through a series of sessions uh, throughout the course of the year. But what we thought would be good to do today is uh, spend a little bit of time focusing on how the exports, the crude oil export debate has shifted since we had a conference uh, on this uh, roughly uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, if For those of you who are regulars, which I can see some of you in the audience, uh, a year and a half ago, one of our good friends, Rusty Brazil, uh, who uh, runs a company called RBN Energy, uh, made an impassioned plea uh, for us to let our molecules go, free our molecules, um, which was, you know, which was a very sort of funny overt uh, uh, statement from someone who claims to not have a political bone in his body. Um, but at that time, the question was really, will we reach a saturation point, and how will this issue manifest itself? Uh, and it's really been interesting to see that it, with the advent of low oil prices, with all of the sort of geopolitical issues that have cropped up around the world, how this issue of crude oil exports has risen in terms of its strategic significance uh, across a range of issues. Um, and so. 
What we thought we would do is start with uh, Ted Kassinger, who was actually at that first uh, session that we had. For those of you who don't know Ted, uh, Ted is a partner at the Washington office of O'Melveny and Myers. I think I said that wrong last time, so I want to make sure I got it right this time. But he's also uh, been general counsel and then deputy secretary of the US uh, Department of Commerce uh, and has been a lawyer in and around the Washington area for a long time. Uh, and Ted is going to talk a little bit about what has changed uh, in terms of the US crude oil export debate. He is going to spend a little bit of time on the, the sort of the crude oil exports baseline understanding, because as we all know, sort of in Washington, as issues evolve, people generate their own facts and opinions on things. It can get kind of confusing. So we're going to go right back to the baseline uh, of, of what some of those uh, uh, rules, regulations are, and what kind of progress or, uh, or evolution we've seen on that issue and what we might expect to see over the next uh, year and a half or so. Uh, and then we're really pleased to have Sharon Burke uh, here, who is a senior advisor at the New America Foundation, uh, recently off uh, a very successful stint as an assistant secretary, assistant secretary for Defense of Operational Energy at, at uh, at the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, I told Sharon the other day, uh, I had a meeting with somebody who uh, was telling me how successful uh, the Department of Defense has been in uh, tracking its energy usage throughout the department and, and was for sort of focusing on some of the other strategic issues that they need to focus on. And I thought, what a, what a, you know, a wonderful thing to say um, because I know how hard Sharon has worked uh, towards that effort and how hard it was. So uh, to have someone sort of sort of checked the box for her from their inside opinion was, uh, uh, whether it's true or not, was uh, a compliment to the work that you've done. <laughs> um, and Sharon's going to talk a little bit about uh, looking at this crude oil export issue from a national security perspective and an energy security perspective, which was a, a good bit of what she did uh, during before her time at, at DOD, during her time at DOD, and now uh, what sh some of the work that she's uh, focusing on. So without further ado, Ted, why don't we go through your presentation, and then we'll uh, move on to Sharon. Great. Well, th thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, it is a pleasure to return. Uh, I well remember that panel when uh, uh, that I joined Rusty on. Although, uh, you know, anybody on a panel with Rusty Brazil is uh, <laughs> d d distinctly a part of the audience as opposed to the panel. Uh, Rusty and I had a very interesting sidebar conversation after that panel about the relative differences in processing uh, condensate, uh, which uh, manifested itself several months later uh, in, a, in a way that we'll discuss. Um, so uh, although I, I have a feeling that most people in this audience are, uh, understand very well at this point, 18 months later, the, you know, the fundamentals of what the crude export ban is, uh, I thought, you know, uh, to use a favorite Washington term, we ought to do a little level set first. And so let me walk through initially just the basics on what the legal framework is, because that is the point of departure for the debate rage that uh, will, uh, is going on, will go on in Congress about what to do and how you might change the ban. So that's where we ought to start, and let me, uh, let me do that. So quickly, it's important to understand that there's not a single statutory basis for the crude export ban. It actually, uh, the ban resides in a number of different statutes, uh, all of which were passed during the 1970s. Uh, the, the one that most uh, attention is focused on is the uh, Energy Policy and Conservation Act, 1975, general comprehensive ban, but there are other statutes we can't forget about, Mineral Lands Leasing Act, Outer Continental <coughs> Shelf Lands Act, Naval Petroleum Reserves Production Act, and the fundamental authority for the export regulations themselves is the Export Administration Act. So any, any legislative proposal to uh, address the ban has to address all of these statutes. They all basically say the same thing, um, but nevertheless, it's a, you know, a pretty comprehensive web of, of legislation. <clears throat> Zeroing in on EPCA, uh, the, the fundamental uh, language is the, the president, the law requires the president to promulgate a rule prohibiting the export of crude oil and natural gas produced in the United States. Pretty, pretty straightforward uh, and unambiguous, except this kind of oddity that the law requires the president to <laughs> propose a rule. It doesn't, it's not a direct ban itself. Then uh, the law authorizes the president to exempt from any prohibition crude oil or natural gas export, which he determines to be consistent with the national interest and the purposes of the law. The, the key part of that really is the national interest, uh, broad discretionary authority, uh, but 
ser you know, a serious test, national interest, uh, and as we'll see, fairly rarely exercised. But some of the debate you hear is about calls for the president simply to exercise authority under existing law to uh, exempt further categories of crude or to broadly uh, lift the ban. He could do that, uh, but it would require a pretty significant step on his part. Uh, we'll return to this later, but the, uh, the other statutes, the MLA, the, off <coughs> the off Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, the Petroleum Reserve Act, all also create exemptions, uh, possible exemptions, for certain swaps and exchanges. Uh, and this is when we hear about the PIMEX, which regularly is in the news proclaiming it's uh, on the verge of getting a license from the Commerce Department for a swap uh, that ties into this authority. <clears throat> so the, the fundamental thing to understand is that any crude oil that's produced in or that enters the United States, as from Canada or from another foreign source, can't be exported to any destination without a license. So <clears throat> if, it, if it's in the United States, you act, have to go to the Commerce Department and get a license to ship it out. There are no restrictions on exports of petroleum products. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, as a consequence, as our early, the earlier panel uh, noted, there's uh, significant product exports. Um, I think I, uh, I, I thought the current uh, level of gasoline exports was something like 30 percent of production. So it's, but whether it's uh, 15 or 20 or 30 percent, there's a, a lot of product exports are going out of the United States, uh, and there's no limitation on that. So if you can export products, but you can't export crude oil, the fundamental question is, what is crude oil? And there is a regulatory definition in the Commerce Department export regulations. You, you see it there. Uh, the <clears throat> question around condensate exports uh, stems directly from the language that's highlighted there. Uh, hydrocarbons, which have not been processed through a crude oil distillation tower. So what is processed, what constitutes the distillation tower has been part of the debate, uh, controversy around condensate exports. <clears throat> but if you fit this definition of crude oil, you have to get a license uh, in order to exit the U.S. So as a matter of policy, the Commerce Department, uh, which administers these rules, uh, has adopted a few uh, specific instances where it says it will grant license applications. Uh, so exports from Alaska's Cook Inlet to Canada for consumption in Canada, uh, in connection with an SPR exchange, uh, up to 25,000 uh, barrels a day of California heavy crude oil. Uh, foreign origin crude oil, <clears throat> where the exporter can demonstrate that the oil is not of U.S. origin and has not been commingled with oil of U.S. origin. So this is an issue with Canada bringing in crude oil from Canada, can you keep it sufficiently pristine and uh, through pipelines or tankers, uh, tight cars and storage facilities so that it's not commingled with U.S. crude oil. If you can do that, you can readily get a license to re-export it. You have to get a license, but, you can get, but it can be re-exported. Uh, there's a catch-all. Uh, Commerce says it will grant a license uh, in other circumstances where there consistent with findings made by the president under the other statutes. Um, that is a catch-all, not, not uh, much in play. <clears throat> in addition, uh, Commerce Department will, <coughs> uh, in the rules, uh, uh, there are two circumstances involving possible swaps or exchanges. Uh, the general rule on swaps, which would involve uh, swaps of crude oil with of uh, any foreign country. Uh, there's a three-part test. Um, basically, you have to show that a shipment you want to send out of the U.S. Uh, and what you bring in or, or an equal <coughs> in great, uh, it's an equal or greater quantity, <coughs> excuse me, of the import. Um, there's a sort of an easy uh, term. You have to be able to terminate the contract. But the most important part of the three-part test is number three, 
the, app the applicant for the export license has to demonstrate that there are compelling economic or technological reasons beyond its control such that the applicant cannot reasonably market that crude oil in the United States. If that sounds like a tough test, it, you're right, it is. The Commerce Department has never granted a license uh, under this test. Um, been some question, discussion about whether, with the, for example, the collapse in oil prices over the last year, you know, can someone demonstrate their compelling economic reasons? Um, no one has yet, as to my knowledge. <coughs> so the, the potential is there, but it's illusory. A little bit more interestingly, uh, Commerce will also consider a license application for uh, in it, something uh, most of us call exchanges with adjacent foreign states. Uh, so you, this is Canada or Mexico, basically. For Canada, it doesn't really matter because you can readily get a license to export to Canada for consumption in Canada. So <clears throat> the question that's uh, been more on the front pages is can you get a license to exchange crude oil with Mexico in sim similar quantities? And the answer is yes, uh, and it's kind of a mystery why it hasn't happened. Um, at least since last summer, uh, there have been, Pemex has periodically announced it's applied for uh, a license application from <coughs> Commerce uh, to exchange up 100,000 barrels a day of uh, Mexican heavy for U.S. light. Uh, and any day now, you know, it seems like uh, you know, they expect that license to be granted. I, I, I can't imagine what the hang-up has been. Um, I think any, uh, the, the principal challenge, I think, is to show that the uh, swap or exchange under this rule would involve incremental additional crude. So there's a fair amount of Mexican crude already contracted to be sent to the U.S. and refined in the U.S. You can't say, I'm going to take part of that and, and match it up against a U.S. cargo as an exchange. You have to find some new buyer, new crude. Um, it hasn't happened. I think it will happen. Uh, I, I don't think it involves any significant policy decision on the part of the government at all. I think the Commerce Department will, as a matter of course, consider these, these licenses, and when the facts are, are sufficient, they'll, they'll grant one. So that's, that's the basic... Uh, you know, lay of the land in terms of the, the ban. I uh, thought I'd step back and, <clears throat> and over the next couple slides say, how did we get here? Uh, and then talk about where we're going. So how did we get here? You have to look back a century, really. <clears throat> um, for the first part of the 20th century, uh, the Texas Railroad Commission really effectively controlled U.S. production of uh, of oil and, and consequently global oil prices. Post-World War II, uh, the, the real issue was oil imports, not exports. Um, the uh, monopoly asserted by the, the TRC came under great threat as imports um, began to pour in the United States as oil fields in the Middle East and elsewhere began to be developed. Uh, by the late 1950s, the government had come up uh, with a system of so-called voluntary import controls, and then uh, ultimately under the, in, <coughs> President Eisenhower, towards the end of his second term, actually imposed import controls. And that was the big, big concern, uh, not exports. Uh, just kind of rapid fire uh, through the, the 70s, uh, uh, you, President Nixon imposed wage and price controls, uh, and alloc allocation controls, um, oil, Great concern was oil production, which continued to fall in the U.S. Imports continued to increase tremendously. Um, by 1973, the Railroad Commission abandoned any longer uh, any effort to continue to control production. Um, and uh, many of you, looking around, some of you, at least my age, will remember the gas lines of the of the early 70s, mid 70s uh, that resulted as uh, production just collapsed in the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> and there were long gasoline lines, a lot, uh, lot of concern. That actually predated the Arab uh, oil embargo, uh, which occurred later in the 73. Um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of concern about uh, adequacy of, of oil supply in the U.S. Um, so, uh, oops, let me back up. 
So uh, that set the stage uh, and for what then became this series of laws that we referred to earlier, 1975, the EPCA, uh, actually the Mineral Lands Leasing Act Amendment slightly preceded that, and then you had the other statutes in the 70s as well. So the, the notion was great concern with scarcity, need to keep the oil in the U.S. Um, uh, we had this price control system, so uh, had to put export controls on in part to prevent people from selling uh, oil abroad where they could get a higher price than in the U.S. where it was controlled. Uh, and you kind of, we stumbled into the system of export controls that has been in place ever since. <clears throat> So, uh, 1981, uh, first executive order of President Reagan uh, was to remove the price and allocation controls on oil, but we still have the, the ban. It's been in place. <coughs> uh, during the 80s, uh, a series of little incremental openings there, um, all based on this kind of notion that the president can uh, create exemptions through the national, exercising his natural interest, national interest authority. 1985, exports to Canada for consumption. Um, that was right around the time of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, really tied to that, as you remember. Uh, exports from Cook Inlet, uh, exports of Alaska, <coughs> North Slope, uh, excuse me, uh, California heavy crude. Importantly, 1995-96, uh, Congress uh, itself opened the door uh, by authorizing the president to uh, issue a, a national interest, interest determination on uh, exports of North Slope, Taps Oil. Uh, that, that occurred under President Clinton. It's been a fairly long period of time, and now we, we get to 2015. <coughs> uh, I raised the question, Mexico. Um, February 18, Senator Murkowski, a number of other senators uh, uh, wrote the <coughs> uh, Secretary of Commerce urging that uh, Mexico be given the same status as Canada, at least, uh, under the, the export ban. That is, you could export to Mexico for consumption in Mexico without limitation. Um, for, uh, for every reason I could think of, that's a very good idea uh, for <clears throat> both economic, national security, political reasons. Uh, I think that could happen. Um, you know, I don't have a specific prediction on it, but it seems like a very logical thing that for the president to do, uh, and maybe we'll see that as the next uh, addition to the string of exemptions that's occurred. So take a moment on process condensate exports. <clears throat> uh, interest of full disclosure here, um, I represent Pioneer Natural Resources, which actually got uh, one of the two classification decisions, commodity classification decisions uh, that uh, have to do with process condensate exports <clears throat> last spring. So uh, in the middle of last year, uh, the Commerce Department did issue the, what's called a commodity classification decision to Pioneer and to Enterprise Products, uh, confirming the assessment of those companies that <coughs> uh, condensate process through a distillation tower uh, in the fields for stabilization purposes uh, is not crude oil under the de definition uh, that we looked at earlier that's in the regulations. It is, uh, there is a uh, distillation tower process that goes on. It's sophisticated, uh, uh, and uh, it had not occurred to anyone before. But uh, as we looked at that, we realized you know not every stabilization process involves distillation towers, but some do. Uh, and we asked the Commerce Department, uh, and um, we're not surprised when the Commerce Department confirmed uh, our analysis there. So a Commodity classification decision is something the Commerce Department does every day, um, whether it's the crude oil export regs or any other export regs. Uh, you know, there are questions about how products are classified uh, under the rules and then how those rules apply as a result of the classification. And so there's a very standard process. You write in, uh, present the facts, the department confirms your, your classification or says, no, actually it's classified in some other way. Uh, and that's, that's all that happened. There was no you know, significant policy decision by the administration uh, having to do with condensates. Uh, it was simply a very fact-specific decisions on the uh, facts presented by these two companies. Uh, it did become somewhat controversial uh, when it became public later. Uh, 
uh, a number of companies asked for similar uh, decisions. The Commerce Department took a, a relook uh, and <clears throat> at the overall approach, and on December 30th issued FAQs that explained the process, the, the analytical process that they would go through uh, in order to reach these decisions. Uh, it is exactly the same questions that, that uh, Pioneer and Enterprise got. Uh, and uh, again, I think the department would emphasize it's a fact-specific decision, case by case, not a policy call. Nevertheless, it does, it did open the door for some uh, crude oil uh, to be processed in a way that hadn't been thought of before and, and exported. Not necessarily huge amounts, but uh, was, you know, notable, uh, let's say. <coughs> So let me just talk a little bit about, you know, what's happened on the arc of the political debate you know, over the 18 months since we, we first got together. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing is there's been this incredible march of third-party analyses, uh, <clears throat> which have consistently headed in the same direction on the uh, merits of the crude oil export ban, whether from an economic or national security standpoint. Jan Mears, who is here with Resources for the Future, was one of the first. Uh, uh, the, and a lot of the initial uh, studies, including Resources for the Future, was on the question of, you know, how does, how does the ban, if you lifted the ban, what would happen to gasoline prices? Because that seemed to be the political concern. Uh, the conclusion that Resources for the Future reached, as well as all the later studies was either no impact or prices would tend to be depressed. Um, but there was, I, I think, without pausing on any single study, it's worth just looking at the march of these. Uh, ICF, IHS, Brookings, GAO, Aspen Institute, which studied the impact on the manufacturing sector, uh, EIA studies, <coughs> uh, C Congressional Budget Office, Columbia in January, um, Ken Medlock at the Baker Institute uh, most recently in March. Just one after another, deep analytical studies, uh, all reaching, uh, substantially informing the debate uh, in a number of ways, but in every case concluding that from an economic standpoint, the U.S. would be better off as well as from a national security standpoint. I would put up a slide showing all the studies on the other side, except there are none. <clears throat> Literally, there has not been a single analysis reaching a different conclusion. Um, it's also been notable, as you look back over time, how uh, former senior officials from the current administration and prior administrations, but once freed of the shackles of office, all have reached the same conclusion <clears throat> in public. Um, uh, there are many that I could put up, but uh, you know, a couple of the notable ones included uh, Larry Summers, Dr. Summers, uh, when he introduced the Brookings uh, Institute uh, and NERA report last September. Um, you know, pretty ringing words, right? The, <clears throat> the, the, the question of whether the U.S. should permit exports is easy. The, the merits are as clear as the merits of respect to any significant public policy issue that he's ever encountered. Couldn't be less am ambiguous, right, about where he stands. Um, Tom Donilon, former national security advisor to the president <coughs> at the rolling out of the Columbia study in January, uh, laid out a powerful, clear explanation of why it's in the national security interest <coughs> uh, uh, of the United States to lift the crude oil export ban. So that's just two. But there are many others, Michelle Flournoy, uh, Sharon's former colleague at Defense, uh, Carlos Pasquale at the State Department, there's a list just from this administration, um, but you can go back to prior administrations as well, former officials who have stood up. How many, again, I could put up a slide that says, you know, people on the other side, and it would have no one on it. <clears throat> so uh, you have former policy officials, you have any number of experts in the area, I won't uh, pause on these long, but you know, it's one after another, op-ed, either a testimony, editorial writers, uh, pretty surprising. I, you know, in my mind, the initiation of the public debate here actually kicked off in uh, late 2013 when in the same week and out of the blue, to me, both the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal editorial pages called for a lifting of the ban. 
and they have done repeated uh, done that since. Uh, but not just uh, newspapers, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, and others. Um, <coughs> so you got the the experts, former officials, the editorial writers. Uh, where are we today? You know, what are the prospects for change? So we're at the 40th anniversary of EPCA. Uh, price controls ended in 1981, um, but still the export ban lives on. Uh, we had uh, House and uh, Senate hearings uh, uh, in March. Uh, I think you can expect more hearings uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, Senator Burkowski, <coughs> uh, leading an effort in the Senate on a comprehensive energy bill, uh, similar effort underway in the House, not on crude oil exports, but uh, you know, on generally on energy uh, uh, measures that you, uh, would probably be the, the will be the you know a place where this issue will be debated and, and maybe incorporated as time goes forward. Um, I think it's important to, <coughs> to to also keep in mind the external and security environment. Uh, the debate over Iran sanctions, uh, Russian adventurism in, in Europe, <coughs> uh, have the question whether, you know, should the president act unilaterally, will, will, should Congress enact legislation or both? You know, I think personally it'll be some combination of the two. Uh, and let me conclude just by one quick look back. You look at the arc of the debate. So 18 months ago when we, when we started, it was, what is this ban? And, you know, why is it, what's it about? Why is it still here? And most of the uh, initial discussion was all about gasoline prices and what's the impact there, because everyone assumed that was the political issue. You know, the expert studies have, uh, you know, I think have kind of answered that question so much so that at the House hearing in March, um, uh, even the uh, witness from the AFL-CIO, which opposed lifting of the ban, said there is no question the global pr prices set gasoline prices in the U.S. There's no debate about that issue anymore. <coughs> um, the debate then moved into kind of the secondary market impacts. Uh, I think, you know, you look at the uh, Brookings study, that Charlie Eminger here uh, led <coughs> uh, in September, the Aspen study, noted, you know, very in-depth report on the uh, impacts of on manufacturing. Uh, and I think that's important as people began to realize this is not just an oil and patch issue. Uh, then you had the collapse in oil prices in the fall, and there was a lot of discussion about, well, is this issue even relevant anymore? Uh, in an environment of low oil prices, who cares? You know, my personal view is the answer to that has been, <coughs> uh, I mean, that has been answered because production keeps rising. The, the uh, gap between, uh, WTI and, and Brent uh, continues to expand. You have thousands of steel workers being laid off uh, because of the collapse in the energy industry. So I think the, the answer is it's still relevant. Um, well, where we are today in the debate, I think, is over the impact of keeping, of lifting the ban on a few refiners, not all, but a few refiners, and then environmental concerns. Is it, is it consistent with the efforts to address uh, greenhouse gas emissions? So it's, it's gone a long way over 18 months. And uh, you know, the hardest thing in the world is to get uh, a law changed. Uh, it may not be changed. But I think we're in a very different spot than we were 18 months ago. Let me conclude there. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think it, it would be good for me to start by telling you a little bit more about who I am, because I think that's part of the reason that Sarah wanted me to come today. Whenever you have a speaker before you who's talking about energy security and energy politics, you need to know where they stand, um, but you really need to know where they sit. So um, I work for a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Uh, I'm the only person that works on energy security issues there. I do not take any money at this time from anybody who has a dog in this fight. I do my own work, whatever I feel like doing, which is largely concerned with energy and warfare and the relationship between the two. So my view is heavily colored by the fact that I'm a former defense official. And the Defense Department comes at this issue in two significant ways. One is, how would changing the export ban uh, affect energy geopolitics? 
um, and the use of energy as a tool of national power. And then secondly, DOD comes at it in a way that no other government agency does. It's a major consumer of fuel. Um, if it were a country, it would consume more than about, I think, two-thirds of the world's nations. So this is a very significant consumer of fuel. And keep in mind, it's a consumer of refined product, not of crude. And DOD, depending on where we are in the world and what we're doing, consumes and buys most of that fuel overseas. So that's where my view is largely colored by. So you do hear in this debate a lot of people talking about this is a national security issue. It's a driver. It's an imperative. So uh, a, a, I think it's a DOD term. I don't know if this is in normal uh, parlance, but the bluff, the bottom line up front. The bottom line up front in this is, is it? Yeah, kind of, sort of, to some extent. It's a mixed picture. It is a national security issue, but it gives and it takes here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why I think that um, and why it's both yes and no. Start off by saying, what is the security problem when it comes to energy? Um, well, first, it's the scale of demand, um, the pattern of demand. The global market is, what, 89, 90 million barrels a day right now? Um, and so it's that global demand and where the demand is growing that has a lot to do with how secure, reliable, and affordable our supplies are. The United States consumes right now about 18 to 19 million barrels a day. So we are still a major consumer. We still have net imports, right? We still need to supply some of our own fuel by importing. That's going to be true for, I don't know, a little while at least. Um, maybe forever, who knows. And we have a very important choke point in our own economy, which is transportation. Our transportation sector is overwhelmingly dependent on petroleum. And I know these are basic facts, but it's good to lay them out about why is demand such an important driver in energy security. So when, so when there are shocks, that's where we're vulnerable, because transportation is a, is a basic sector in the U.S. economy, and it touches all things. It touches agriculture, it touches commerce, it touches residences, it touches everything. So when there are price shocks, it reverberates throughout our economy. And that is the core of our vulnerability when it comes to energy and the fact that we're part of a global market where other people's demand determines what's available, what's affordable, and how reliable it is. Of course, the other thing that determines that is the supply. What's been the problem up until fairly recently is not so much the overall supply in the market, but the concentration of supply. So who has it and the fact that it's highly concentrated in specific countries and regions and that those specific countries and regions have a terrible habit of being unstable um, and in some cases being unfriendly to the United States and to our interests. So whether they do it deliberately or just as a matter of course because they're not stable and oil has a tendency to do that to governments um, for a variety of reasons I think most people in here are well aware of, uh, we can't control how reliable that supply is. We haven't been able to historically. Uh, I think I, I did some counting and about 46% of the world's oil supply still today is in countries that the Transparency International uh, rates as corrupt and uh, that in the um, stability index, state stability index are rated as unstable, ranging from extremely unstable, like Libya, to somewhat unstable. So, you know, almost half of the global supply still is in these countries. That's been the problem, is the concentration of supply and the unreliability of the supply. And then the other problem has been, of course, energy as a weapon and resource nationalism and the fact that most of the world's oil supply is in the hands of countries that use national oil companies. So it's a, it is a direct element of state power. Um, Russia obviously has used that to great effect for some time now. They're not the only ones. Lots of countries use energy as, a, as an element of state power, and that's been part of our energy security problem and concern. And then there's a fourth area that I'll touch in more about whether or not these are still problems, which is there's a general issue of, of national character and national power at stake here. So first on demand. So U.S. demand is flat or declining, as we've heard earlier today. Um, it, it, people, do talk, people used to talk about peak supply in the United States. Now they talk about peak demand. So is the United States going to only stay at this or lower? Uh, with CAFE standards, uh, with other efficiency improvements, 
reasonable to think so. At the same time, of course, if there's economic growth, you may see some more growth in demand. It's hard to say, but we are not going to be the drivers in demand in the world economy. It's going to be Asia. It's going to be other economies. It's going to be China. And we'll get to that in just a second, what that means. So, you know, and also there's a really interesting sidebar here. As natural gas becomes more available, everybody's watching that, too, to see how that might affect and electric vehicles. I, have, I do have a colleague uh, at my current at New America who's very interested in, in electric vehicles and very optimistic about the penetration of that. Well, that could also deflect, affect our demand in ways that are pretty significant. Um, natural gas, I think, in personal fleets, not so much, but in heavy fleets, fleet vehicles. Um, that could change our, the structure of our demand. And again, to me, these are all economic arguments for pushing, for liberal, uh, liberalizing the export regime. Um, but keep in mind that as a national security person, one of the things I'm really concerned about in demand is that we've been the biggest customer in the world, and there's a certain amount of strategic leverage and power that comes with that. We are not the biggest customer in the world anymore. China is. And a lot of our partners in the world, and specifically in the Middle East, are looking east. That is a very interesting strategic reorientation that will not be affected at all by liberalizing the ban on exports. And it's something that bears a lot of watching. I know you're going to do work on that, and you have been doing work on that. To me, that's a really important strategic driver that's, that this is irrelevant to and that the United States needs to watch. Um, the concentration of supply. Um, from my point of view as a national security person, increased U.S. production helps no matter what because we're displacing our imports. Other people are able to buy them. We're exporting refined product. We're affecting the global market, period. Um, to me, it, this is about efficiency of that process. So liberalizing the export policy, to me, is fine. Why wouldn't you? It's, it's an economic driver. But as far as the security driver goes, the big deal here is more US production, no matter how it hits the market. I, on some level, I'm agnostic. I don't care. Um, I just happen to believe it's more efficient to, to release the export ban, but the bottom line is it doesn't change. So, um, so it, to the extent that the United States allows producers to respond more efficiently to market signals, all to the good. But it's not, that's not the primary driver then. Um, I think what's very interesting here on the supply side is, again, the possibility of North American producers being a stabilizing influence in the market. The thing that's been so difficult for us on a national security side is the volatility of this market and the unpredictability of it. And just even in the last few years, if we hadn't had so much U.S. product coming on market, even with a ban on crude exports, you would have seen so much more price volatility and so many more spikes. Libya coming off, Iraq's in trouble, Iran under sanctions, Russia under sanctions. This would have been a catastrophe. We wouldn't have been able to do it. Frankly, um, so we would not have been able to hold coalitions together to maintain sanctions because of what it would have done to energy prices. So the stabilizing effect of having reliable producers growing in the market, and Mexico, there's lots of reasons to be optimistic about that um, at this point, that they're becoming a, a more reliable producer um, to the market. To me, that, that's a really important influence. Um, as a, again, as a national security person looking at the geopolitics of this, having a more stable, reliable market gives us a lot more uh, room to move in, in, a, in global relationships. Again, it comes back to one thing I think is very interesting that it would be very interesting to look at is one of the chestnuts has always been Saudi Arabia is the only place that has spare capacity. So when you do have these things popping up, where you need to stabilize the market. They were the only people that could do that. They were the only country that could do that. Um, of course, we don't function that way. We're not a, we don't, you know, we're not a state controlled. On the other hand, tide oil, shale gas, these are different ways of bringing oil to market. How, how fast could we react in a supply crisis or in a, in a price shock? How fast could we ramp up? Um, can we function as spare capacity de facto, even though we're never going to do that as a state policy, um, except for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which has uh, rather significant limitations in its effectiveness? Um, I think the answer to some of that is it, it's limited. 
you will never get around the fact that 20 percent or so of the world's oil right now is coming through the Strait of Hormuz. That will remain a choke point until we can displace 20 percent on a dime. We'll still be vulnerable to those shocks. So that doesn't necessarily change if you, if you lift the export ban. Um, and I think it comes back to, in the last panel, a very interesting question about where can we compete and where is this oil going to go? And that gets to the question of energy as a weapon. Um, again, we don't use energy as, a, as an instrument of state power the way other countries do. So when we say um, we could affect the dynamics with Russia and Ukraine by promoting exports of oil to uh, Europe, or we could affect the rebalance to Asia by promoting exports to Asia, you know, it's going to be, that's going to make its own choices. The market will choose, and it's going to be a question of where we can compete. We certainly overall are affecting those dynamics, but again, that's not necessarily a question of where the crude goes, although we certainly have important allies who have very big refining sectors, and does that allow us to draw closer to, say, South Korea? It might, and I think that would be certainly an interesting um, aspect, but as far as whether we can use this to affect what's happening in Europe right now, I, it doesn't work that way. Um, it'll depend on where the market is. So, um, or where the joint venture is, you know, where the economic incentive is. So it depends. I don't, that's not a very strong argument to make. It certainly mitigates against how those countries can use their energy as a weapon. And that's where it gets more interesting. Um, because of the low prices, Russia, Iran, these countries are not able to wield that weapon as effectively. But again, that's not dependent on crude oil exports. That's a factor of the U.S. and North America producing more in general. Again, it wouldn't hurt if we were more efficient about how we convey it to market, but it's not a direct effect there. But keep in mind that even though this is all to our benefit and we like this, it also hurts some of our friends and allies. You know, the low prices right now, whether, you know, and our contribution to it is a real problem for our strategic interests in Iraq. Um, Iraq is really suffering with having the lower income from their oil sector, that's not in our interest. So it, when I say it's a mixed picture, it is a mixed picture. It gives us more leverage with Russia. It destabilizes Libya and Iraq, where we have a very strong interest in stability, and we've put our troops on the line for that. So it, it is a mixed picture. Um, we have other allies, formal allies, and very important strategic partners around the world who do not benefit from this. Um, you know, again, as a defense person, I'm very concerned about the relationship with Qatar and Kuwait, United Arab Emirates. We have very important relationships and bases there, and this is not good for them. So it's a mixed bag. Um, I think where you get a really interesting argument that I find very persuasive is what you know, my former colleague Michelle Flournoy wrote and what uh, Carlos Pascual, my other former colleague, wrote, which is it's more about how the U.S. looks in the world and that we have to be willing to walk our own walk. If we're for free trade, we're for free trade. If we're going to bring complaints in front of the WTO, then we need to be able to, to say that we also are promoting the same values. So an export ban um, is not consistent with that. And I do think it matters um, how we appear to the world and that we live by our own values in areas such as this. So I do think that matters. But again, that's not a direct national security argument. The direct national security arguments are, are not so strong. The indirect ones are very strong, that it's about how we look in the world and how we uh, use our national power to promote our interests. And in that case, I think that there's a very strong national security case. So as I said, it's a, it's a mixed picture. Um, as is often the case with the politics in this issue, it's not that simple. It really depends on what you've got in your backyard, um, so to speak. Um, and that's the, really the picture I wanted to present at this point. So. Thanks. Okay, so that was a lot to add to an already complex morning. Um, uh, what I want to do is uh, maybe ask a couple questions and then open it up because we're going to run a little bit late on time here. You know, the way that I look at, and Ted, I really liked your presentation sort of tracking the evolution of the issue over what is sort of a very short period of time as far as issues evolve, but quite frankly, the supply surge has been, you know, over a record period of time, so why don't we speed up the politics a bit? Um, you know, I, I see it as a debate between um, 
incrementalism, right? You know, there are incremental ways that we can sort of continue the process of sort of opening the door on, on the crude oil export van versus making an argument for a new way of thinking about the way that we manage this issue, right? And, and it cuts on both sides of what you guys have been talking about. One, and, and quite frankly, what we were talking about this morning, which is, are you, what is, what is the choice that we're asking policymakers to make or, or the way in which we're trying to ask them to think about it from a strategic vantage point? Is it about uh, trying to find little ways that the issue becomes a little bit more acceptable because, because a wholesale change would be, you know, drastically uh, drastically different or have some sort of repercussions. Ted, I was really interested in, in, in sort of your perspective. You, you sort of, you know, lined up all the ways in which people have made the case very, very compelling. And, you know, according to your analysis, there is nobody on the other side of the ledger. That's either a, a, a terrifyingly deafening science, silence, right? Uh, or or it's, a, it's a statement of where the problem stands in terms of, or the, I guess the issue stands in terms of people's ability to absorb all of the potential interesting implications. One of the things that I get concerned about is when you look at the complexity of the investment decisions that we talked about this morning, and we didn't have an upstream producer here, but we had IHS Sierra come in with their latest uh, study last week and talk about sort of the complexity of the analysis on the sort of economics of the, the boost that it gives here in the United States or what, you know, what the, the marketing of crude oil exports would look like uh, abroad. These are really, really complicated issues. Is it that people just don't know yet what the conclusion is or they're not sure if it's an incremental approach that we should be taking or sort of a, a wholesale rethinking of the policy in general? Where do you, where do you think we'll see this move? I think that we will see it move most likely in an incremental direction, um, but not necessarily a predictable one. The, uh, I think the issue is, is complex. Um, for one thing, lifting the crude oil export ban is not on the top five list of anyone in Congress, whether Republican or Democrat. You know, this is the compelling national issue that we need to address. And so uh, I think in terms of education interest, uh, there are a lot more people aware of it uh, and inquiring than there were even just a few few months ago. Um, but to move into the realm of action, I think there has to be probably a lot more of that, that discussion that goes on, uh, as well as continued leadership by some people who have, who have put it at the top of their list. Um, but I think caution, uh, concern still about potential political uh, ramifications of gasoline prices going up. I think, you know, uh, the easiest thing is to do nothing, uh, and so I, 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 you know, I think it'll move along pretty slowly uh, as an issue, unless there's a significant crisis that precipitates uh, a reason for action, or uh, there is some kind of additional incremental proposal out there to look at, you know, a partial lifting of the ban or something like that. So just a, you know, a pause on the uncertainty uh, and the, you know, the, the. Uh, ability of a surprise to come up. You know, if we come back from the, the recess, uh, the Iran negotiations have fallen apart, the legislation moves forward as it, in its current state, the proposition, uh, you know, and currently on the table is that the U.S. would threaten sanctions against countries that don't reduce their imports of Iranian oil to zero, to de minimis. Now, we're talking about Japan, South Korea, uh, China, and others. If we really went in that direction, a lot, of, a lot of challenges there, but one of the first questions is, you know, are, is the U.S. really going to take that position and say, but, but we're not going to sell any crude oil on the market? It becomes almost untenable. So, uh, or if, you know, Russia did something more uh, in Eastern Europe or the Baltics, you know, would, even if you can't say that crude oil exports today would, you know, solve this issue in, in Europe, still what would people be looking around for something to do. So that's the kind of issue that, you know, could come out uh, surprisingly to, for, you know, force a decision earlier than people might otherwise want. One, one point about refiners I wanted to make, you know, the refiners and then there are refiners. And when you talk about uncertainty, you know, I, uh, in t investment decisions, I have to think that an integrated producer with a refinery probably looks at this a little bit different than someone, uh, you know, an independent refiner, and 
we know from public comments, even among that, that group, there are different views on this. And then you have some small refiners in the Northeast which have a particular problem in terms of access to crude. I can't imagine a circumstance <clears throat> where there is going to be sufficient certainty that the export ban will never be lifted <laughs> or altered that would cause at least some of the larger uh, refiners to say yes, and that'll cause us to make the $500 million investment, you know, in a wholesale uh, recasting of the re refiner that we have today. I mean, it, it's always going to be there to me, and ever more so as production, you know, the production ability in the U.S. occurs. So, you know, the large refiners, they're free traders. Um, so I, it's a little hard to see where that certainty ever occurs. I think Ted's point in there too that the optics matter and that so for example if there is a crisis and we do liberalize exports and say that that's to deal with Iran or Russia it won't really make a huge difference but it matters that it looks that we're taking action I mean, that's how we got this bad law in the first place right because we had to do something the pressure to do something in response to the price crises in the 70s um, so you know, this would be something that's uh, more constructive than this ultimately ended up being. But at the time, it was in good faith. People were trying to figure out how to deal with a crisis. So the optics matter, even if the reality lags a little bit. What I was going to ask you, actually, Sharon, because it was, it, uh, it's, um, I think, within the national security space, I and mean, when we were starting to talk about this in, in 2013, it was a bit of a no-brainer for us because it was, you know, whether or not we need time to decide how we're going to deal with this, which is sort of the, the party line at the time, um, people were picking up messaging. Whether we were delivering it or not, right, people were picking up messaging, the, the international audience that we were sort of talking to, asking about the foreign policy and national security implications were saying, your lack of a decision is signaling something. It is signaling that you're questioning some of the fundamental principles that have always been there. Is that really what's on the table? And so I think that one of the things that I was curious about your perspective on is, first, you know, from an international audience perspective, I think no matter how we eventually get around to addressing or not addressing this issue, people will pick up messages intended or otherwise, right, from that. We, we know that our, our words and our choices matter, right, pivot. Uh, uh, so, um, but but then also, you know, how we how we do this from a national security perspective matters. I think we saw this a lot in the LNG export debate, where we we basically came to a process. We understood what we it was that we wanted to do from a domestic perspective. We had time to feel a little bit more comfortable uh, about what was happening within gas markets and how much gas would leave the United States. I would argue, in a period of low oil prices, we can feel a little bit better that it wouldn't you know be one of these situations where a huge amount of oil would leave the country and we'd actually be doing a lot to boost investment investment in places that might be uh, harmed by a lower oil price environment now. But the signaling of it, if there's a foreign policy opportunity to be taken where you can say, oh, we're wielding a, a softish, hardish power, there's people on the fence about wh which camp we energy folks are in, so stay tuned. Um, uh, but, but if there's an opportunity for that kind of signaling, it, is it something that you think from a national security perspective does actually build a case? I think there is, but I think one of the reasons that um, that it only goes so far is is that the voting public or the American or the public that doesn't vote, um, the American public will, I think, accept that argument. And you do see that in polling that one of the few arguments that that is consistent over time is the national security um, messaging around energy. H however, they're going to care about it a lot less when prices go up. And you know, all things being equal, prices will go up at some point. Mm -hmm. And so they'll buy that argument a lot less when it means that they have to pay more. Or cut a different way. And which is why this is going to be on the slow boat that Ted's talking about. But I mean, I think um, there are ways to use this messaging. I won't, I won't out the colleagues in the room who were with me on this, but um, before I left government, we were in um, Nigeria on a presidential mission talking to leaders there. This was in December 2013. And you know, we were talking to them about the need to address some of their internal problems uh, with how they manage um, the income from their energy sector. And we were talking about their macroeconomic exposure and, and some of the, just how, what a precarious position they were in. And we told them, you know, we think prices could go down. Now, did we really? Well, roll the dice. That day, we, were, we, did, we all agreed that that was a good message to carry. 
and that they were terribly exposed. And we could see a situation within a year of prices going down to $60 a barrel. And um, you know, did they believe us? And, and did it make our message? Uh, maybe, maybe so. But I will say one of the officials we talked to looked me right in the eye and said, well, that's OK. We're just going to sell to China now instead. So you know, messages go both ways. But yes, I do think that kind of messaging matters, and particularly when you want something specific out of it. Whether it matters to the US public, I think, will depend entirely on what the price is at the pump. Mm -hmm. Sort of issue maybe uh, to discuss, and Ted, it's because you brought it up. I mean, there, you're right. We kind of, uh, the pattern in Washington often tends to be sort of clearing through a variety of strategic issues. Uh, you know, one at a time to get to an end state. And, and the one that hasn't necessarily been fully vetted at this point is sort of the environmental angle, right? And that's something that we bring up in the study that we released earlier this year and something that we'll be dealing with over the course of these uh, policy issues that we think uh, matter. I've got a personal view on, on how that'll manifest itself, but I don't know if you've done any thinking about uh, where that debate's gonna go. Uh, I it's interesting that so far that has not been a significant part of the debate around the lifting the crude oil export ban. Uh, there have been uh, some NGOs that have taken an interest, um, but it, you know this is not Keystone, uh, at least yet. Um, it's not the idea of lifting crude oil exports uh, has not you know assumed a kind of you know iconic uh, status as uh, you know testing of where one is on on environmental issues. Um, so it remains to be seen whether that, that would happen. I think there are some signs that there will be concerns, but it won't ever, you know, hopefully not, get to that kind of level of, of debate where you lose the, the facts uh, on either side. Um, so uh, I think it's out there. I think there'll be concerns. I think uh, you know the responses that some analysts have made so far, of course, make sense to me, and I, I'm not sure. Uh, and I think may be persuasive ultimately, and that is there's not a lot of indi indication uh, that lifting the ban would significantly increase GHGs in the U.S. Uh, and, and if the goal is, you know, long term to uh, reduce <coughs> uh, emissions, which it is, uh, there are far many better ways to address that than trying to control the supply side. So you really need to work on the demand side there. And, and I think a lot of people understand that. Okay, well, I want to open it up for questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, we, so we'll start with John in the back. Kinko's got a microphone for you. you want the John Shager, Strategic Petroleum Consulting. Uh, Ted, um, under current law, if crude oil is exported from the United States up to Canada and then mixed with bit, bitumen and then comes back into the United States through a pipeline um, and all the other uh, criteria are met, to keep it separate, it's no further commingled with anything else. Could that dill bit be exported? Uh, tempted to say a bit. Uh, uh, that's a very, it's an area of uh, <laughs> remarkable lack of clarity. So uh, yes, to you, so the basic rule on commingling is that the Commerce Department, and let's setting aside the dill bit issue, but if you bring Canadian crude, let's say through pipeline to uh, a port in the U.S., store it, uh, as long as there is only incidental co commingling, that's the magic phrase, with domestically produced crude oil, uh, that Canadian crude oil is considered to stay Canadian, not U.S., you can ask for a license and export it. So the deal bit issue is suppose you send condensate like crude from the U.S. to Canada. It's, it's used to uh, dilute tar sands or you know, heavy crude brought back in the U.S. Does it still exist as a separate set of molecules, U.S. origin, uh, and when it's brought in the U.S., do you need a license at least for those molecules? Uh, and there's no clear measure about that, to my knowledge. Um, I think you can start with the, you know, Incidental commingling, so small bits of you know mixing with um, with the bitumen uh, is okay, I think, uh, and, and the crude that brought in even diluted from Canada still considered Canadian origin. You can get a license, but whether it's you know as you move up the mix, 
Um, I think, the, to my knowledge, at least the Commerce Department doesn't have a, you know, a, a magic spot that says, no, that's too much. Uh, but there is a point where it's too much. <laughs> so I, I don't have a better answer for you than that. Uh, I think it's, you know, it could be they know it when they see it, you know. But clearly some is okay. Uh, Bennett Johnston, Johnston Associates. Uh, the previous panel indicated that the potential uh, export market is two and a half million barrels a day. Is the spot market sufficient to absorb that much, particularly light, sweet, crude, or do you need long-term contracts? Uh, that would be particularly a salient question if the president decided to, to incrementally uh, lift the ban. A bit of a discussion. I mean, I think the, the discussion on the earlier panel was a question of whether or not it would be up to the volume of two and a half million barrels a day. And I think Martin, you talked a little bit about the ability to absorb uh, 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 that kind of crude into the market uh, over a period of time. But I, I think the, the the questions are about whether or not that much, in fact, would leave, right? Uh, and and how much it would be at that time. But I don't know that if you guys have done much thinking about it. I don't know the answer to your question whether you would need whether the structure of long term or or spot contracts would make a difference. Um, I think your question raises I think probably goes to the more interesting point uh, whether if you were pursuing an incremental approach would one thing could one thing the president do even under his current authority but Congress could do as well is to permit exports up to a cap you know. Uh, and maybe you start with two or two and a half million barrels a day, see how that goes, and you could increase it over, over time. Uh, and that you know, makes a lot of sense to me. I think the cap has to be high enough to be meaningful. Uh, Charlie Ebinger, Brookings. Ted, in response to Sarah's question, you kind of hinted that you did not think the environmental issue had gotten the salience of the keystone within the, I think you were referring to the external environmental community. But my question relates, what do you think is the attitude within the administration itself? Do you believe, whether you're talking about crude oil exports or a keystone, that there aren't some people in this administration who really genuinely believe that all these activities lead to greater use of fossil fuels and hence more GHG emissions? Yes. <laughs> there are, I, so there are, yes, but there are also some who don't believe that. So welcome to every administration. I think the other thing, too, is that we haven't had a very developed conversation in this country about how to have your cake and eat it, too, in the context of the climate challenge. And so I think that we've been having a sort of um, a, a, a defensive discussion rather than a proactive discussion. And I do wonder if if a period of low prices where you're evaluating oil and gas competitiveness from a U.S. perspective, from a U.S. upstream perspective, from a U.S. refining perspective, all the way through to the most economic cost-effective ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions over the long term is just a very underdeveloped conversation so far. And I, I, my money is that we're going to have it. I, I mean, I think what Ted said was really, actually, a really gr great point, which is you know, I think the environmentalists that are arguing this are making a moral argument. They are not trying to make an, an economic argument or a security argument. They're saying it's a moral argument that you don't want to put more supply in the market. You know, and I respect that position, but I think what Ted's point was, though, it's a demand problem. And if you can't, you know, the global demand for this is keeping economies afloat, and taking away the supply doesn't change that that problem. So you have to address the demand side. And I think that's where the, the discussion needs to go as it gets more robust. Oh, sorry. Uh, Nelson Lee from BHP Billiton. So I'm the guy who did the condensate exports out of the United States for the first time. So as an upstream producer, I figured one of the Sharon's questions was how long does it take for Eagleford to switch on and off? So we're shutting down most of our fields, or two-thirds of them, because of the low oil price. And we think we can ramp them back up probably in about 30 days. 
So there you go, that's one month. I guess my question is, um, you know, we're already exporting condensates. Um, and I don't think the question is whether, well, it is whether we're allowed to export condensates, but it's, does the infrastructure there for them to actually export? So one of the reasons why Pioneer hasn't actually gotten anything out is because they simply can't logistically. So the question is, is if the government or the administration allows crude oil exports, are they prepared to maybe wait a year or two before meaningful exports go out of the country and have any effect? Just as a factual point, and Pioneer itself should address this, but it has announced that it has shipped uh, numerous cargoes out of the U.S. of condensate. So um, there are, has been a fair amount that has gone out. Well, they have a marketing, you know, well, it's, but it's Pioneer. I mean, but in any, it doesn't matter. There have been, you know, significant uh, uh, numbers of cargoes, let's say, not only from Pioneer Enterprise, BHP, possibly some others uh, that have gone out. I, I don't, you know, personally, I, I think the administration um, does not see those shipments as, uh, you know, particularly relevant to the bigger question of lifting the crude oil export ban. You know, that was a, again, a commodity classification decision by Commerce. It's considered downstream product. There'll be some market, you know, forces that determine how much goes out, including the infrastructure issue. Uh, but uh, I don't think whether there's none or a lot of exports under that kind of fr framework will affect the broader uh, decision about whether to further, to liberalize the ban. Thank you. Uh, Fred Lawrence from the Independent Petroleum Association of America. Um, just in terms of what you were talking, Ted, about the arc on crude oil exports and um, sharing what you were talking about in terms of, you know, the national security perspective, how do you see these, um, this whole infrastructure build out optionality? So you have pipelines and increasingly you have rail, you have waterborne exports increasingly becoming involved in you know, midstream companies getting more involved. Um, how do you see this um, this optionality playing out? So you have the rail issue, which is becoming a, a bigger deal in North America um, versus pipelines, and of course the waterborne issues playing a bigger role. How do you see how do you see these concepts working together as as we go forward? Because these are very large investment decisions, as as are refineries, and of course some of these may have national security. Um, issues as well as economic. I, I, I do, I think that's an a important point and I, I do think it's possibly also what Senator Johnson was getting at, which is the incrementalism of this decision, does that unlock sufficient investment? Um, as people have to make some pretty big decisions that are gonna be having longer term horizons. Um, and I'm not sure that incrementalism gets you there, particularly in the current price environment. So I think it's a, an important question. And I did notice that EIA has started doing, just added um, rail into their tracking, which I think is extremely helpful in, in knowing how to answer that question, because we haven't had enough information to even address the question. So, but it's a fair point. Yeah, I would just add that it, in part it may be a regional issue. So in the Southwest, there's tremendous amounts of investment in infrastructure, pipelines, storage capacity, you know, everything around the refining complex in the Gulf Coast that's going on uh, and will be built out. And so the ability to export from the Permian or, for, you know, further from the Eagleford, it, I think is going to be there. I think it may be different if you're talking about the Bakken or, or Colorado and the issues around rail car transportation, I think, are real and, and threaten the very idea of product. I mean, cause people to be concerned about production at all. Uh, so, so uh, one more final, took us two more final things. One question for Ted. I mean, one of my preoccupations with all of this has been that um, I think what people really are finding, both in industry and on a geopolitical perspective, troubling is that they really don't know how the thinking around this issue is evolving from an administration perspective. And part of that has to do with the way in which 
the incremental sort of licensing changes have happened within, you know, the Department of Commerce, very, very different from the process in terms of LNG exports. There's not a lot of officials coming out and making public proclamations about where the wiggle room lie, you know, line uh, is, is drawn on some of these issues. Is the transparency aspect of this discussion a problem? Uh, is is sort of the the ability to hide behind a black box and uh, and not necessarily make those distinctions that part of the public discourse um, is that a problem that that either the administration or Congress should be thinking about so that we can be having a more sort of open debate about those issues or is that really just sort of rearranging the deck chairs um, and then just really quickly for both of you because we're going to run out of time I, I love bluff I did not know bluff before but bottom line up front. If you think about this from sort of a behavioral economics perspective, what are the what are the um, the opportunities uh, that we might not be realizing, or the harm that could be realized based on the way in which we make these decisions, both sort of economically and then for you on sort of the geopolitical side? How should we be thinking about this as an opportunity that we we could be wasting based on the decision that we make, or some sort of you know harm that might be felt because we we do something different? Why does this matter as much as we're we're spending all this time talking about it? So let me start with the first one, and then Sharon can <laughs> address the second one. <coughs> uh, so on the first, I don't see transparency as a particular concern here. The, the, the you know, sort of debates about relative transparency have mostly dealt with the particular peculiarity of the condensate classification decision. Uh, and that's just driven by the, the framework, company-specific requests, you know, company by company, a lot of factual business and uh, confidential business information involved in those. And, but Commerce came out with its FAQs. I think everyone knows, you know, the analytical framework. The bigger question of, you know, opening the door for further exports of crude oil itself, you know, that's a policy call that will be debated. Uh, it's not, you know, going to be made by a Commerce licensing officer. Uh, so I think that we'll have plenty of and robust public debate around that. Just on the, on the first point, Sorry. Yeah. we don't want to kill the front row. Um, on, the, on the first point, um, I, I think one of the problems is also that, that our, our means within the U.S. government for making energy policy are, are fragmented. There's a lot of players in that space, and they're all coming from different points of view. Um, and that's true in the legislative and in the uh, executive branch, where, again, the views aren't strictly partisan, even on the Hill. They have to do with what's in your district um, or what's in your state. So you might see senators and members that are not on the same page even. So it's complicated, and that does make it hard, I think, for us to be. It's not a transparency problem. It's just we just don't have the means to, to make concerted policy um, smoothly in this area. On the, on the geopolitics, I, I mean, I think that the, the export ban, again, was done in good faith that at the time that it was enacted, people thought it was something we needed to do, but it's not an effectual policy. What good is it doing, and what, how is it protecting the energy security of this country? And the answer is nothing. It's not really effectual. So, um, but it, it may be causing problems, certainly as far as our ability to influence the broader market and the efficient functioning of that market. What I worry about also was, is are we missing an opportunity to lessen our vulnerability to short-term shocks by making a more reliable market and a better supplied, more reliably supplied market. Because to me, that remains a big problem for us because 30 days for Eagleford is not good enough. Um, the economic damage that would be done within 30 days to a sharp shock would be overwhelming. And, and again, I think people are somewhat complacent about that, that, oh, you know, the, the Strait of Hormuz will never close, and if it did, we would open it. Um, I would, I'm not at all complacent based on what I saw from my time in the Department of Defense. So it seems to me like that's one of the opportunity costs for not doing anything about it, is we do have an opportunity to mitigate a vulnerability like that. And, and given that the policy is not effectual, why not take it? Mm -hmm. Just briefly adding to that, I, it is important. It is an issue important to address. Um, I recently went back and looked at the 2008 Quadrennial Defense Review, <coughs> um, which, you know, really captured the posture of thinking at the time, which is that, that you know, the defense strategy, strategy of the U.S. proceeded from the assumption that the U.S. was, go, was all a 
huge rely or uh, hugely reliant on imports of crude oil and would be for the foreseeable future. And, you know, when that was written in June or July of 2008, no one imagined what was going to happen on the production side in the U.S. So we have a, a totally different uh, posture, both from a national security and an economic standpoint today, and it affects millions of jobs. Um, it affects our whole way of thinking on the defense sector. Uh, we have immediate foreign policy issues that are affected by the whether we keep the ban or not. So it is an important issue, and I, you know, I think it rightfully is occupying a lot of attention. Well, we obviously think it's an important issue, too, but it's uh, among uh, a number of them that we're going to be focusing on this year. I mean, any time you've got sort of the strategic shift that the U.S. has taken in terms of energy posture in light of what's happening around the world, uh, it's time to rethink how you're positioned. So we've got a number of issues we're going to be taking up this year. This is certainly one of them. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for hanging in there through the carbon chain and all. You guys stuck it out. You should be congratulated for that. But please uh, join me in thanking uh, Ted and Sharon.